So today, if I gave you the magic superpower of control to control one thing, I wonder what your answer would be to this. If you had the ability to control what you would be known for and what others would say about you, what would you want to be known or said about you? If you had total control over that today, would you want to be known as the, the strongest person? Would you want to be known as the smartest person or maybe the kindest person? or the most godly person, or the, the most uh, intelligent person in the room, what would you want to be known for? What would you want your legacy to be? The most lovable, the kindest, the smartest. It sounds like a high school senior superlative, doesn't it? But, but what would you want to be known for? What would you want people to say about you? So I want you to think about that list. What's the one or two or maybe even three things that you want to be known for, or you would want said about you. I want you to keep that in mind as we continue with today. We're continuing a series we started over the last few weeks called What Our World Needs Now. And we're getting towards the end of it here. And we've been looking at what you and I could do to impact the world around us in a better and a different way. And for those of you who don't know me or maybe visiting today or watching online, thank you for being here. My name is Trey. I'm one of the pastors here. And it's always an honor to share with you when I get the opportunity to. And I know how awkward or weird it can be to walk into a church for the first time or to tune in online. So thank you so much for entrusting us with your church experience today. I hope that you learned something or gleaned something from our time together. And if you want some pictures with a turkey, make sure to stay afterwards. And uh, Grace and Jeff will be over here. It it was so funny when he's reading the Bible verse in a turkey costume, right? Like I couldn't hold it together. That was funny. But today, as we continue this series, we started this with the goal in mind of helping you and I, if our world needs anything right now, it's for us to be more Christ-like. And we talked about this idea of looking at this verse that Paul gives us, writing to a church in early Galatia. And here's what he said about what it looks like for you and I if we're going to, to impact the world around us. He said we should be more close to God by doing this. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, which is the idea of being as close to God as we can. And as we are close to God, following Him with our lives, that these attributes and qualities will flow natural from us. And then he gives us those things. And he says this, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, which is this idea of the closer we follow God, these things will begin to flow from our lives. We'll be more lovable. We'll be more joyful. We'll be more peaceful. We'll be more kind and patient and good and faithful, gentle and self-control. And so the word we're going to study today is this idea of gentleness. And I think most of us, when we look at this list, we're like, yeah, I want to be more, more full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. But, but gentleness? Mm, I think I could skip that one, right? And I think the world would still be okay, especially for us guys, right? Like we, we don't really want to be known as gentle because we think of gentle as, as weak. And we're like, why would anybody want to be, to be gentle? Well, today, as we actually unpack this word gentleness, we're going to look at what it really means to be gentle with our lives. And I think as we learn more about what this word means, it's going to help us all be more inclined to allow God to use our lives and allow his spirit to flow the word gentleness through our lives. Because if we're honest, if the way that we view gentleness now would probably look something like these memes that I saw this week. It'd be more described this way. Okay, I'll be gentle. Just do what I say, please, right? And this is how some of y'all are speaking to each other. 
and you think you're really gentle, but you really look like this. Um, how about this one? Maybe our parents can relate to this one. Me in the morning hoping to be a better parent one hour later, right? Does that describe any of you? You don't have to point to the person next to you, right? But, but really, that's how gentle you and I really are when it comes to our lives. We try gentleness, but it really doesn't work out too well when put to the test or to practice. But there's a reason I think it made this list that Paul describes, because I do think it's more important than any of us realize. And as I was studying for this word this week, I went back to one of my favorite Bible verses, and I didn't realize that the word gentle was in this passage. And it's Jesus describing himself and ultimately describing what it means to, to be God himself, but also that he carried this attribute for us to be able to live out in our lives as well. And maybe if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard this verse, but maybe you've never seen this as well. This verse is describing Jesus as the Son of God, one of his highest qualities. Let's look at this together. It's found in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, and it says this, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's normally the piece that we like, right? And we tattoo it on ourselves or put it in our bathrooms. But here's what it continues to say. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am what? Gentle. For I am gem gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so I would heard this verse, you know, for so many years, but I never picked up on this, that, that I am humble and gentle, that that was a quality, an attribute that, that Jesus describes about himself. And so when we're coming to Jesus, we're coming to this God that, that is full of gentleness and humility. Pretty cool to think about, that that's what the Son of God came to show us. And then if you look back, at um, the Old Testament, there's a guy named Isaiah, and he's speaking on behalf of God, prophesying this future king that is supposed to come, which is Jesus. And here's what he describes about Jesus even before Jesus gets on the scene. He says this, Look at my servant, whom I will strengthen. He's my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to the nations, but he won't shout or raise his voice in public. Isn't that crazy? And then he continues, he will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. And so it speaks to the heart of God and, and, and bringing Jesus to us that, that Jesus came in humility and gentleness, not raising his voice and shouting at the rooftops and getting everybody to see him. Because you think like son of God, you can do anything, right? And he could probably be the loudest person in the world. Yet he came in with a different sort of spirit. And then Matthew records this, the same verse quoting Isaiah says this about Jesus while he was here on this earth. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Quoting the verse from Isaiah that, that this guy Jesus is actually who God said he was going to be, and he's proving it by the life that he's living. Now, you and I don't use phrases like this in our modern day language. But I want us to look at what those really mean because I think it speaks to who God was and his personality. It says this, is a bruised reed he will not break. Now you and I are like, what's a bruised reed? A bruised reed back in the day would be grown up around a riverbank. And it was this very fragile piece of flower grass that would come out of the ground. And if a bird landed on it, it would immediately break. It was very fragile and weak. And you're not able to kind of be able to use it for much. Some people would use it to make baskets and things like that. But what this verse speaks to is that people are like this. People are bent. They're broken. They can be hurt. But yet Jesus isn't that way. Jesus doesn't break us or throw us away. That they're, we're more precious to Jesus than you and I even realize. And then it says this, that a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Now, you and I are like, what does that even mean? How many of you guys have a candle in your house? Any of them smell like Christmas yet? You guys got some Christmas candles? Been visiting Bath and Body Works and Yankee Candle? Yeah, I know you. Yeah, y'all people. So back in the day, they didn't have Yankee Candle stores. So their candles looked something like this. It was a very different candle. And so what would happen was a wick would go through here and come out this end, and oil would be dipped down in here. But the bad thing was when the candle would run out of oil, the wick then would burn itself out and then it would, you know, burn out the flame. 
And so what this picture image shows us is that when there's no oil in here, that the, the candle can't burn properly. And so Jesus modeled this so well for us in this idea that this first century lamp, it was tiny, it was elongated, and, and, and the flame would go out if there was no oil in it. When you run out of oil, and, and I think me and you, we're similar in this sometimes, right? We, we run out of oil, we run out of gas in our own lives to the point where we're like, God, we need your help. And see, the cool thing is that Jesus is saying he adds the oil to fan our flame and to keep us going. He doesn't condemn us or put us out. He handles us with fragile care. And I love that. I love that that's who our God is, that you and I matter that much to him. And so Jesus, he modeled this with everybody that he would interact with. There were people that, that they were like, why would Jesus hang out with that person and this person? And they were like, oh man, Jesus is going to tear them apart. And yet he showed them a different way. He showed so much care and love and kindness and gentleness to people that really didn't deserve it. People that culture had pushed off to the side and said, they're not good enough. They, they've messed up. They didn't have what it takes. And we've read some of those stories in this series. But Jesus shows us a gentleness that is hard for us to understand or comprehend. But in these moments, sometimes we just need to pause and realize, are we exemplifying this kind of gentleness in our own lives with our spouse, with our family, with our kids, with people around us that we like and people that we don't like? Are we gentle or are many of us, we, we're quick to respond, we're quick to react, and we're quick to post and not take time to really understand what it means to be gentle to those around us. Because here's the thing, gentleness is this idea that it's the spirit in which we do all of the other actions. So gentleness is how we, we talk to people. Gentleness is how we treat people. Gentleness is how uh, we show ourselves to a world that's all about reacting and being the opposite of gentleness. The Greek word in the Bible shows us that gentleness is this from this translation, which means to be meek. And that isn't mean to be weak, which most of us think about gentleness. But gentleness is this idea of like, in the Greek, it would be like taming a wild stallion. Anybody ever seen this? Maybe you've watched shows that this happens, that there's these wild horses, right? It looks something like this, right? And the Greek word here means that, that to tame this wild horse. Now, it doesn't mean to remove its power. It means that they're taming and controlling the power that it has. Imagine this image of going out and finding this wild horse and try to train it day after day to be a better, a different horse that can be functional around others, not dangerous to those around it. And when you tame that stallion, it's still just as strong. It's just that strength is brought under control. And see, that's what gentleness is. Gentleness is the power of your potential under God's control. It's your power of your life under God's control. It's fully submitting to God's control of your life allowing God to tame our souls. And we've seen a lot of great people and great leaders lose influence because they lost control of themselves instead of giving under submission to God and allowing him to help us. It's breaking our stubbornness. It's choosing to break our aggression, our anger, and even our fixation of control. And to break in a horse is used this phrase to gentle them. And I think that's how God wants us to do that in our lives as well. The horse doesn't lose its power, just like you and I. We don't lose our power when we come under submission to God. We actually have more power because we're accessing the heavenly power that God came to give us under God's control. Popular pastor Billy Graham put it this way. I love this. He says, a river under control can be used to generate power. A fire under control can heat a home. Gentleness is power, strength, spirit, and wildness under control. It's a great way to put it, isn't it? That gentleness is the idea that we still have this power, but it's in submission to God and allowing him to use our lives to showcase our strength through him. And so once again, gentleness isn't weakness. It's actually power under God's control, which means something like this. Gentleness is strength under control. It's you and I's strength under God's control. 
And so how do we do that? How do we live out this rare trait in a world that, if we're honest, is very harsh, isn't it? I mean, think about every area of your life. You can remember moments where gentleness wasn't shown to you. Maybe you were a kid and a parent treated you with harshness or or spoke to you in a way that scared you or treated you in a way than what showed their anger. Maybe at work, it's all about pushing other people out of the way, climbing the ladder, trying to get known, trying to get people to like you. It's the opposite of gentleness. Or maybe in your personal life, maybe you've had people post comments about you under a picture that you posted. Or maybe it's somebody showcasing their anger towards you. And maybe you weren't what made them angry. You were just the wrong place at the wrong time. And we have divisive spirits tearing each other apart. Or maybe you've even seen this at a church. Churches and Christians can be mean, can't they? They can be harsh, using God's truth to beat people up or to yell at people or create toxic guilt that was never placed there by God. And it's shaming people under a pretense of using God's name in vain. Never how God intended it to be. Or maybe in your home, this is where it gets the worst. You and I wear scars from our past that showcase that people didn't treat us the way that we deserve to be treated. Maybe it was an anger. Maybe it was out of frustration. And so Paul gives us another list that describes these characteristics. And I hope and pray that these do not define you. But if today, if any of these do, there's hope for you and I to find a gentleness that Jesus wants to give us. Here's Galatians 5.20, another list that Paul gives us about what it looks like to live in this harsh world. He says it's full of hatred. It's full of discord and jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions. You've seen this, right? In your world, in your workplace, in places that you visit and see. Maybe some of you have experienced this in your life, and I'm so sorry if you've experienced this in ways that left you damaged or hurt. Because it can cause a lot of pain to us. These are things that act out of the flesh, not out of the spirit. And our world is full of this right now. And so for you and I, if we're going to choose a different way to live, gentleness is important because it shows the world something different. When gentleness isn't in action, it shows these things. But when gentleness is displayed in our lives, that's when the fruits of the spirit come through. Love, peace, joy, kindness. It's gentleness that we act out all of these things. So what could this look like in you and I's everyday world if we were to choose to live out gentleness in a world that desperately needs it right now? And this is for all of us if we were to choose to do this. I think it would show the world a spirit of humility. And I think that's what our world needs right now from all of us is a spirit of humility. Gentleness is about living with accessibility and not thinking of yourself better or more important than everybody else. See, gentle people often have this this calming presence. You ever been around somebody that you just love to be around because they just just bring you calm and peace and they're they're just easy to talk to and hang out with? They prioritize empathy and understanding in their interactions with others. They're gentle people and they tend to prioritize the needs of others over the needs of themselves. And they have a difficult time dealing with aggression or confrontational personalities. See, gentleness is approachable, it's accessible, it's making sure to focus and listen to the people in which we're having conversation with and actually giving them time and attention. It's showing empathy, care, compassion, and concern. And so would that describe you today? Do you have that quality in your life? Or are you so busy and rushed and and on edge that that gentleness isn't really one of your top qualities? Maybe it's more like you're just quick to react and, and quick to show anger instead of slowing down to realize that you could display a different kind of way. New Testament writer James in chapter three tells us about this, what it could look like. He says this, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it. I love that. If you know who God is, and you know his ways, it's like we've been talking about the series, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there's a selfish ambition in your heart, he continues by saying, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. 
For jealousy, jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and he even says they're demonic, right? You're like, dang, James, you call me out. All right, keep going. He says this, for whatever there is, for whether there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of all kinds. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. I love that. And then he says it is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. Isn't that like what we all want to be known by? It's like, man, if that were described in my life, I'd be like, yes, I've arrived. I did good. Thank you, God. You can take me now, right? But obviously that's not who we are because James has to remind us of this over and over again. And so do the other biblical writers because for sometimes our, our flesh shows up more than our spirit. And I pray today that we could allow ourselves to come under God's control a little bit more and to allow the, the anger and the hostility to dissipate and, and allow peace and gentleness to come more and more into our lives. Another spirit that I think shows up when you and I are more gentle is this, is a spirit of appreciation. We begin to appreciate people more around us because we're not worried about reacting to them. We're worried more about caring for them. Appreciation means to raise the value of it, to raise the value of others and to raise the value that you place on other people. See, when you talk bad about other people, when you're negative about other people, when you're posting hateful comments about somebody else, what you're doing, whether you realize it or not with that unkindness, is that you're actually devaluing that person. You're depreciating that person's value by what you say, making them feel belittled or unimportant. And see, when you appreciate somebody, you do the opposite. You actually raise the value of somebody and you actually raise the value of yourself because people see you in a completely different way. I love this quote from Jerry Bridge. He says this. He says, gentleness is illustrated by the way you would handle a carton of exquisite crystal glasses. It is the recognition that the human personality is valuable but fragile and must be handled with care. So think about that. The people around you, they're valuable, but they're also very fragile. And when you're gentle with them, you actually handle them with care. How many times have you handled the people around you with care recently? How many times have you been patient with the people that, that kind of drive you crazy sometimes? I think sometimes if we're honest, gentleness is probably the last quality displayed in our lives, especially with those closest to us. See, every person is valuable to God. You've never locked eyes with somebody that doesn't mean everything to God. And gentleness is how we handle, how we treat those people because every person has heavenly worth. And when you see the value in somebody else, it's hard for you to talk down to them. It's hard for you to be unkind to them. It's hard for you to speak negatively or gossip behind their back because you realize they have value and you have value. And so from now on, when you want to react, when you want to get angry, I want you to look at the other person and just be reminded that person matters to God too. And it changes the way in which we appreciate people. And it leads to reconciliation and it leads to us choosing not to do what everybody else is doing, but to show the world a different way. And lastly, what it shows us when we live this gentleness out is a spirit of trust in God. Because you and I realize we can't do this on our own, right? Like we know we woke up this morning and the last thing that we were is gentle, right? With the way that we treated people around us, the way we walked in the church and we had a fake smile real quick, but we're like, you should hear what I just told my kids, right? Because a lot of us, it's hard. This is not easy. And if it were easy, all of us would be like gentle, kind people all the time. It's going against the grain of our humanity. But we see a difference in people who are close to God, who choose to walk differently because they're close to God, they're walking with him. And because of that closeness and walk with him, gentleness begins to flow from them. 
And most of the time we're not gentle or we act in anger because we didn't get our way or we felt like we didn't have control. And you and I, when we don't have control, sometimes we feel like we're, we're losing it. But when we place our faith and trust in God, we can kind of lay back a little bit, realize that we don't have to be in control all the time. We can submit to God's spirit and allow gentleness to flow more from us as we follow our Savior. Because if our Savior is known as being humble and gentle, and we say, hey, I follow Jesus with my life, those things should become our things. And the more and more we follow suit with Jesus, the more and more we become more like him. I came across a story this week that I just thought was incredible. It was about a guy named Don. And uh, Don was this guy who, in all honesty, he was like the man's man, right? Like he was in the Navy. He did all these cool things. And his sister-in-law is writing about him as he has passed. She's like writing his eulogy. And she writes about it in her book, Glorifying God. And as she writes about this in her book, I want you to read what she says about Don. Because Don's one of those guys that you, you wouldn't imagine to be known as gentle. And I gave you a list, right, at the beginning. I said, what do you want to be known for? And I want you to listen to what Don was known for. And as we hear about what was said about him, I hope that you realize that one day, you hope somebody says this about you as well. And so here's what, it came, here's what the story says. Don graduated from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. He earned his wings as a naval aviator, became a surgeon, served tours and duty in Vietnam as a surgeon, and was captain of the USS Mercy, providing humanitarian aid to needy countries and achieved the rank of rear admiral in the Navy. He taught surgery and provided care to so many families. He was married with kids and had a remarkable legacy. And this is what Elaine writes about him. Over the years, my love and respect continued to grow for Don. As I learned more about his accomplishments and achievements and travels, though he was very shy and humble to share with me about them, I was in awe of all that he had done with his life. I literally just Googled his name and found all his achievements. But what made him the greatest man I had ever known was his genuineness, his gentle spirit, his love and compassion. I've never known anyone with such deep, gentle, and outward compassion. When you were with Don, you became the focal point of all his gentle spirit and attention. Don made you feel at ease that you were the most special person in the moment. He lived his faith daily in all that he did in his work and in his home, naturally and without reservation for sharing his love for Jesus and his own need to depend upon Jesus. When it came to looking on the positive side, Don walked the straight and narrow path, and he was willing to take a stand for what was wrong. I could describe in detail all the big and little things Don did throughout his life, which would be very uplifting. But being the humble man Don was, he wouldn't want me to do that. And this is what she writes about him as she continues. But what I desire to convey in all of this is that being great is not based on human achievements or standards. Being great and humble is what we do for God and for others gently and quietly. Without calling attention to ourselves, it is humbling ourselves before our Lord. And that's what she described Don did so well. As she continues writing about him in his book, she says, I'm grateful that Don was my brother-in-law, my friend in Jesus, and most importantly, the most gentle, humble, and great man I have ever known. I give thanks that he was in my life and was an example to learn from and grow in faith together. I give thanks that he loved me and that I loved him. I give thanks that he is now in heaven, free from the limitations of his earthly body. I'll miss his phone calls, and I'm sad that he's not on this earth, but his love and spirit remain in all the hearts that he touched. He is a part of my foundation, and I'm forever grateful for his life and his love. Fly high, Don. Elaine. Remember when I asked you what you want to be known for? 
think a lot of us, we say we want to be known for these things, but yet we don't match them with the way that we live our everyday life. We say we want this kind of story, but when we react to people around us, it's completely opposite. But today, you and I have a choice to make. You and I, we follow a Savior who knows all about these qualities. We follow a Savior who gave his life so that we could live out these qualities. And so if you are, you're an angry person, if you find yourself bitter or just selfish or complaining, we can submit, come under control to an amazing Savior. And as we do that, he makes us more like him. And I don't know about you, but I want to be more humble. I want to be more gentle. I want to be more kind and compassionate to those around me. And I think that's what our world needs right now. It's for you and I to not just say that we're those people, but to be those people, to have our strength come under control of our Savior. And as we do that, that it would change the world around us. And so I hope all of us today would maybe change our mind about gentleness. And maybe not knowing that it's, you know, I don't know if I want that for my life, but choosing today say, I desire that for my life. And I hope my actions show it to those around me. The gentleness of that list becomes our list. And when people see our gentleness, I hope that they see the gentleness of Jesus in everything that we do. Not just choosing our way today, but as we leave here today, saying, you know what, my way doesn't work. But today, I want something different. Today, I choose the Jesus way. If you curse me, and I would bless you. And if you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. If you're helpless, I will defend you. And if you're burdened, I'll share the way. And if you're hopeless, then let me show you. There's hope in the Jesus way. I follow Jesus. I follow I will embrace you if you 
Let's give it up for the band. Thank you, guys. Today, let's leave showing our world something different. Let's not just keep showing them our way. Let's show them Jesus' way. Let's show them a different way to act, a different way to react, a different way to love, and a different way of gentleness. And today, I think all of us could use a little bit more of that just with the people around us, but also the world around us needs more of this. And so today, let's go to God in prayer to ask him to give us the strength, the comfort, and everything that we need to leave this place different today so that our world can see the Jesus way. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the reminders from your word, God, that you came to be gentle and humble. And so, Lord, today, as we learn from your word, I pray that it wouldn't just be something we hear, but, Jesus, it would be something that we would live, that we would come under submission to you. And as more of your spirit is alive in us, God, that that we would exemplify a different way to live. And so, God, help us love each other better. God, help us love our families better, our kids better, our spouses better. God, help us love our broken world better. And God, as we show them your way, God, may you continue to get all the glory and all the praise. And we thank you for just being able to gather in your house today. And we pray that we will leave here differently because of it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We all agree together and said, amen. Can we got a hand for our time together today? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. Hope you guys have a blessed Sunday. Next week is our last week of this series, and our lead pastor, Jeff, will be concluding the series and kind of talking about all kinds of things. So make sure to be back next week to hear from that. Hope you guys have a great week, great Thanksgiving, and we will see you back here next Sunday.